the final economic collapse of the nations. There is a saying that the hope of the poor is to one day become rich. That saying suggests that it is a hope that lasts a lifetime. But sometimes it happens that a poor person suddenly becomes rich. Years ago, a friend told me that in South America, with an aptitude for business, one could get rich quickly. But in his view, it was harder to do the same in North America, though the chances here are greater and longer ranged. The truth is that millions of people have material dreams. But here we will see what those material dreams will look like at the end of the world. Because the day will come when there will be a global economic collapse and this time that collapse will be final. Hence, it will be possible for other dreams to prevail in our lives to go beyond the petty goods we can acquire in the short lifetime given to us here. In Ecclesiastes 5.12, the wise Solomon says, The abundance of the rich man permits him no sleep. This was written by a man who was very rich, but who at the end of his life discovered that everything under the sun is nothing but vanity. I was once in a meeting with many people from different parts of the United States. A friend said to me, Do you see that man? He's a billionaire. But I would give him back his whole fortune because he has so many problems that living like this isn't good business either. The truth is that there are people who live to collect goods they think they could someday lack and continue to accumulate properties and wealth as if they could be gathered infinitely. They do not seem to grasp that happiness does not necessarily depend on material goods, but on knowing that the great purpose of life is being fulfilled which is to glorify the Creator who gave us life. History reveals that there has been an eagerness to conquer the world from the very origins of civilization. Peoples, nations, empires were formed, each one growing up with new dreams of domination and power. Hence, there is also the saying that wealth is synonymous with power, and power corrupts, because it produces a struggle to be the greatest and thus be able to impose his, its will on every opponent. The Phoenicians and the Greeks dominated the sea for many centuries, because the most lucrative trade routes were by sea. That allowed the accumulation of great wealth. Then came the Romans, until the barbarians took over the Mediterranean Sea, eventually weakening and even destroying the Roman Empire. The barbarians formed the European nations, after which came the Muslim Arabs, who contributed to the western medieval darkness of Rome to such an extent that a caliph liked to say that Christians were not able to float even aboard in the Mediterranean. Regional lords emerged and imposed throughout Europe what became known as feudalism. To protect themselves from the invasions of other larger rival lords and even of Muslims who threatened Europe during the Middle Ages, these feudal lords built castles with inaccessible walls on a mountain top or on the plain surrounded by a lake. Later came the medieval religious and commercial restrictions. 
The Roman papacy managed to impose itself on all of Europe, seeking control over the medieval kings and all the medieval wealth. By managing the world's economic resources, its power increased and the popes could accumulate unlimited wealth. Their goal was to make all the inhabitants of the earth dependent on them. They could then, they could then act as if they were the benefactors of humanity. In order to remain free from the papal Roman yoke, as well as Catholic kings, well, then, since Jews and later on many Protestants became itinerant merchants. For this reason, every traveling merchant fell under the magnifying glass of the Inquisition. In the quest to maintain religious and monarchical dominance, medieval restrictions were both religious and political, with an underlying economic control base that was the axis of their power. The discovery of a new continent in the middle of the second Christian millennium opened the door to a certain degree of freedom. Trade expanded, opening the possibility for wealth to anyone who dared to venture into a new world full of riches that could be exploited. Many persecuted Jews and Protestants in Catholic countries try their luck far from the continent that persecuted them. Thus, world trade was born while collaborating with the development of religious, economic and political freedom. Medieval political and religious restrictions decreased in Protestant countries. For this reason, Holland became a refuge for persecuted Jews and Protestants. It should not be surprising to us then that Holland gave rise to the first World Bank in the year 609. Many women from across Europe began to travel to the Netherlands to weigh themselves on a huge public scale that was set there. They were given a certificate confirming their weight to offer as vindication before inquisitors who wanted to burn them at the stake that they were not witches for supposedly weighing nothing. However, the Inquisition eventually established itself in America, more definitely in Catholic countries, to prevent Jews and Protestants from settling there. The result was not only a great loss of freedom, but also an economic delay that lasted for centuries because it slowed individual initiative. Colonists arriving from Europe were limited by economic restrictions placed upon them by their European overseers. And all the wealth that could be obtained in America was shipped back to Europe. That wealth can be seen today in the great medieval palaces that millions of tourists visit today every year. The history of world trade highlights the rise of mercantilism that created powerful states, which removed the stately and feudal restrictions that had existed until then. In England was Cromwell, Colbert dominated in France, and in Holland the Oranges. Closer to our time, the era of free exchange erupted in the 19th century, favoring England because of its domination of the sea. Many major trade barriers were also removed, and there was a remarkable freedom of immigration. The Adventist Church took advantage of this juncture to reach everyone with their message, as they were instructed by the spirit of prophecy that restrictions would come in the future, making it more complicated to begin new work in different countries. At that time, everyone could travel all over the world without documents. As the time went by, birth certificates were required, then cards, later on passports, and finally the visas that each country requires for travel today. That brings us to the 20th century, marked by an era known as 
bilateralism in which large states required trade compensation. This era was characterized by economic retaliation between states, tariff protection, quantitative restrictions and change control. We're not going to go into details here. Let us consider what many of us came to experience in the 20th century, a world divided economically and politically in half, communism and capitalism. Which of these two systems was to prevail in the world? When we were young, we said, based on the prophecies of the apocalypse, that American capitalism was going to end up dominating the world. Today, I would say that whether it will be capitalism or not, I don't know. But the government of the United States, whatever the economic system it ends up developing in the future, will go on to dominate the whole world. Communism hindered market globalization for most of the 20th century. But communism as an economic system collapsed. The Berlin Wall fell. I was there on the other side of that wall, on the communist side. And I could see people sitting on an avenue looking west as if dreaming about the day when that wall fell and the rest of the world opened for them. What is the prevailing economic system today? Globalization, a trade without borders. If Solomon had already said of the rich that his wealth does not let him sleep, can we imagine how many people could not sleep for the sudden possibility of extending their trade to the whole world? Trade mega corporations were established that achieved even greater stability than many countries in which they operated – Coca-Cola, GE, Quest, Walmart, etc. Progress in communication facilitated globalization through telex, fax, internet, email, and today through many more media such as WhatsApp, Twitter, Facebook, etc., which allows instant communication from anywhere in the world. This globalization was renamed in two ways that seem contradictory, but reflect the two sides of the same coin. It was called, on one side, neoliberal globalization because of its principle of global free market and free competition, and on the other, neoconservative globalization for highlighting democratic capitalist principles and its alleged link to the freedom of the gospel and Western democracy. For many years, the Catholic Church sought to control trade, but now the freedom of American Protestant capitalism especially is seen as a result of its link to the gospel. Ronald Reagan, then President of the United States, grasped that Western capitalism was ill-seen by communist and anti-capitalist propaganda and that it was appropriate to make it more appealing to the world while unmasking the farce of communism. To this end, he brought to his government those who became the ideologues of capitalist globalization. In Ukraine, the story of the uncle of the Seventh-day Adventist Union medical leader who was deceived by the communist propaganda was dramatic. That uncle told me that the relatives migrated to Argentina and became rich. Deceived by the communist delusion, his uncle sold his belongings and moved to Ukraine, bringing with him his most expensive things in a container. When he arrived at his destiny, he found only stones in the container. And he could no longer live. He spent the rest of his life drinking in bitterness. Fifty years later, his two boys, who spoke Spanish, were able to leave and return to Argentina. Capitalism triumphed thanks to its pragmatism and defense of freedom. The possibility of getting rich and improving society should be available to all. 
In France, I learned an expression that portrayed the dream of many Europeans, Europeans to go to the new continent pour se faire l'Amérique, that is, to get rich. This can all sound really nice, but when the unregenerate human heart is given free reign, such freedom to become rich can end up becoming voracious and atrocious. According to these ideologues of American capitalism, the economic lag in Catholic countries compared to Protestant countries is linked to the concept of freedom of both religions. For Protestants, freedom is a symbol of progress. The aristocratic ethic of Latin America gives more importance to luck, to heroism, to the figure of social position. The Protestant ethics of North America give great esteem to diligent work constant regularity to their responsible willingness to grasp opportunities. The ideologues of American capitalism accuse the theology of liberation in Latin American countries, as well as Catholicism and socialism, of worrying more about distribution than production. If you want to distribute, you must first produce. Well, we will not discuss that point here because this is not the main objective of our message today. Do you want to know the richest preachers of the world? There are more rich preachers, but the list of Forbes, the magazine which publishes the list of the richest people in the world, changed from year to year. I don't include, for instance, a preacher who became millionaire when he was a boxer. I will mention the preachers who obtained their wealth preaching, selling their cassettes, videos, and books, and receiving offerings. Joyce Mayer, American, $25 million. Rick Warren, American, $25 million. Crefal Dollar, American, $27 million. Ray McCauley, South Africa, $30 million. Joel Austin, American, $40 million. Benny Hinn, American, $42 million. Jesse Duplantis, American, charismatic, $50 million. Chris Oyakilom, Nigeria, $50 to $70 million. E.A. Adeboye, Nigeria, $130 million. Pat Robertson, American, 500 million in 2017, but it appeared in 2013 with 100 million dollars. Bishop T. D. Jakes, American, 150 million dollars. He lives in a mansion worthy of 1,700,000 dollars. David Oyedepo, Nigeria, 180 million dollars. Kenneth Copland, American, 760 million dollars. Eric Macedo, Brazilian, 1 billion 100 million dollars. He is the founder of and leader of the Universal Church that is known also as Stop Suffering. Some of them have personal jets and luxurious houses. Others donate money for charitable purposes and employ uh, most of their money to expand their ministry. But the richest religious man in the world is the Pope. He is legally the owner of the entire Roman Catholic Church. Pope Francis assumes a facade of humility before the world by choosing to sit on a marble throne instead of a golden throne as the former popes. Jesus, however, never sat on an earthly throne. And that marble throne of Pope Francis is a blasphemous throne because it is set among cherubim, imitating the throne of God. This means that Pope Francis believes that he sits on earth in the place of God as his earthly vicar. The Roman Catholic bishops and archbishops in the United States live in expensive and luxurious houses. In August 2000. 14, 
CNN held up for consideration uh, 10 bishops who live in houses valued over a million dollars. The title of the news is The Lavish Homes of American Bishops. What a contrast with the Son of God. The creator of the universe didn't come to accumulate wealth. He said, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Matthew 8.20 Let me mention some few of the bishops targeted by CNN. Chicago's Cardinal Francis George lives in a mansion worth 14.3 million as is, but the property could fetch far more. Archbishop James Sartain of Seattle lives in a three-story house. The appraised value is $3.48 million. The National Catholic Reporter wrote in April 7, 2014, that Archbishop John Myers spent $500,000 for an extension on his retirement home. Catholics in Atlanta questioned the acceptability of Archbishop Wilton Gregory's building a 2.2 million residence for himself. And the news has mentioned numerous bishops living in residences worth more than $1 million. Several of them have nuns serving them in their houses. Bishop Franz Peter Tebart's Van Ellis renovated his residence in Limburg, Germany for $42 million with bronze windows frames valued at $2.4 million. The, world re the world's reaction to his flagrant opulence forced the Vatican to suspend him from his duties pending investigation. Cardinal Berton lives in a golden attic in the Vatican, as you can see in this slide, and when the world reacted against him for that, he replied, 30 cardinals have larger homes. Let us read what Ellen G. White wrote more than one century ago in her book The Great Controversy. Conscientious souls are kept in constant terror, fearing the wrath of an offended God, while many of the dignitaries of the Church are living in luxury and sensual pleasure. Do you want to know the richest men in the world? Larry Ellison, the United States, 75 years of age, $64.8 billion. He is owner of Oracle Corporation, computer technology, software company, etc. Mark Zuckerberg, the United States, 36 years, $67.6 .6 billion. He is the owner of Facebook. Warren Buffett, United States, 89 years, $79.5 billion. He has... Uh, Berkshire, Hathaway, In, Jayco, Duracell, Dairy Queen, etc. Bill Gates, the United States, 64 years, $103.3 billion. Bernard Arnold, France, 70 years, $107.6 billion. He is owner of uh, luxury goods company, etc. Amancio Ortega, Spain, 83 years, $77.7 billion. Fast fashion and products include clothing, accessories, shoes, swimwear, beauty, and perfumes. Jeff Bezos, USA, 55 years, $112.4 billion. He is the owner of Amazon. The worldwide economic collapse of 2008 and 9 produced a tremendous impact in the world. There were 1,125 billionaires in 2008, but the economic bubble collapsed in 2009 and the number of surviving as billionaires in the world at that time was reduced in March of that year to 793. $2 trillion were lost in less than one year. There were suicides and family murders. 
Billionaires who became suddenly debtors decided to take first the life of the wife and of the children and then their own life. What a drama! This is a warning of what may happen to all who put all their trust in material goods. Was it a prelude or a warning illustration of what will happen soon at the very end of the world? 83% of the population in the year 2009 saw their fortune sink. Then 44% were able later to become even richer. So globalization favored a few people who could exert more control on worldly goods. A popular saying was fulfilled here that says, a scrambled river is a fisherman's game. General Motors was the world's largest company in 1999. It surpassed Denmark's economy. If it had been a country, it could have been the 26th country among the richest countries in the world. In 2008, it became the second largest company in the world, and in 2009, it collapsed. Obama's stimulus plan had to come to its rescue. The largest company in Europe was Siemens, which employed 480,000 employees. It came into conflict over dirty business dealings with Iran and lost much of its power. Walmart employed 1 million people in 1999 and the crisis hardly affected it. A decade later, it employed more than 2 million people. Because of their size and expansion, large industrial corporations are a stable power and perhaps more stable than some governments which saw them coming and growing. Those companies produce two-thirds of the world's commerce and control a third of the world's wealth. But all this is uh, reeling again today from economic competition between the world's largest Colossus. China remains communist in the political arena but became capitalist in the economic perspective. And the confrontation with the USA, the world's largest economic power, is raising concerns today of another economic capitalist bubble and many fear another even stronger collapse. The United States external debt cannot continue to grow infinitely. At some point, it will collapse again, and we did the world economy that has become mutually dependent precisely for having entered the economic system of globalization. Solomon, the perhaps richest man of his time, had already warned, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Be wise enough to restrain yourself. When you glance at wealth, it disappears, for it makes wings for itself and flies like an eagle to the sky. Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. Given the experience that we had to live in 2009, we could say from our current perspective, because they will create bubbles that will burst and leave nothing. It is noticeable how E.G. White foretold what was expected to happen at the end of the world. The war of the people of God, she wrote, is to prepare for the events of the future, which will soon come upon them with blinding force in the world gigantic monopolies will be formed. Men will bind themselves together in unions that will wrap them in the folds of the enemy. A few men will combine to grasp all the means to be obtained in certain lines of business. Trades unions will be formed, and those who refuse to join these unions will be marked men. This she wrote in 1903. The extravagance seen in the erection of buildings, she wrote, in selfish gratification, in marketplaces, in unfair managing, creates poverty and distress. The guardians of the marks of trade will have a fearful account to render to God when the judge of the highest court 
will take every individual case in hand. Yes, my friends, we cannot conceal the sin in a corporation. If we consent to the sin of a corporation and share the same spirit, we will have to render an account for it also. God will judge the sin of a corporation as well as an individual sin. In this context, we cannot neglect the statement of Jesus in Matthew 19.23. Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Did Jesus say that no rich man will enter God's kingdom? No. There are righteous, wealthy persons who are authentic Christians who support the word of God and help many people in their sufferings. The sabbatical and jubilee laws show us that God gives freedom to develop an enterprise and even to become rich. It is God who gives the power to make money according to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18. But he set a limit. Every seven years they were to forgive the debt of the poor, and every 50 years they had to restore their old property to them. Since I consider this issue in another subject and in two of my books, here we will simply emphasize that it is more difficult for a rich man who relies on his ephemeral material goods to think of spiritual values that are eternal. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, said the Apostle Paul, which is so uncertain. This is one of the principal problems of many people who become materialistic. Put their hope in God, insisted the Apostle, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment, 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. Ellen G. White saw in advance, in vision, a century in advance, the destruction of some t tall New York buildings that had not even yet been built, as well as the destruction of other buildings in other major cities in the United States and the world. She said on an occasion, literally, I was in the night season in New York, called upon to behold buildings rising story after story toward heaven. She did not refer here to the buildings that were already erected, but to those that were to continue rising. She wrote it in 1906 and again in 1909. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof, and they were erected to glorify the owners and builders. I had the opportunity to climb one of the Twin Towers and the guide explained that those buildings were fireproof. But no one took into account that if that building caught fire somewhere in its height, still could overheat and lose consistency. Let us continue reading the spirit of prophecy. Higher and still higher these buildings rose and in them the most costly material was used. Those to whom these buildings belonged were not asking themselves, how can we best glorify God? The Lord was not in their thought. I thought, oh, that those who are thus investing their means could see their course as God sees it. They are piling up magnificent buildings but how foolish in the sight of the ruler of the universe is their planning and devising. Let's add a parenthesis here to mention that the Twin Towers that collapsed a few years ago were 400 meters high, and the Dubai Tower that opened on January 4, 2010 is more than 800 meters and costs $1 billion. Evidently, they were not frightened by the, f by the fall of the two Twin Towers, and these Arabs built a building twice their height. I read that one of the architects who planned that construction was distressed at a certain moment because he said that the project was working well on his computer, but wondered if it would work in reality. And it worked, he said later. Let us continue reading. Those builders, L.G. White wrote, are not studying 
with all the powers of heart and mind, how they may glorify God. They have lost sight of this, the first duty of man. For the commercial district in Dubai, the Arabs invested $20 billion. But the recession of the year 2009 caused the loss of 50% of the investment made by those who bought it. Al Bur is another Arab project in the city of Medina whose owners dream of a building more than a thousand meters tall. That madness seems to have no limit. So, after the economic collapse of 2009, there has been some hesitation regarding the project. Let's continue reading what L.G. White anticipated at the beginning of the 20th century. As these lofty buildings went up, the owners rejoiced with ambitious pride that they had money to use in glorified self and provoking the envy of their neighbors. Competition to build the world's tallest tower is first. If there is a mother here who expects a baby and does not know what name give it, she can take the idea of Arab prince Al-Walid bin Talal al Saud. That prince wants to build a building in Kuwait in Silk City, more than a thousand meters tall too. But not everyone seems happy with that either. Saudi Arabia hopes to build a 1600 meters, four times higher than the Twin Towers. And in New York they ended up building four towers at the spot where the Twin Towers had been, about the same size and, uh, as their predecessors. Much of the money that they thus invested had been obtained through exaction through grinding the faces of the poor. In the books of heaven, an account of every business transaction is kept, said Sally White. There every, there, every unjust deal, every fraudulent act is recorded. I read that many people came to work in Dubai Tower of 800 meters, and many starved because they were paid so little that it wasn't enough for them to eat. The time is coming when in their fraud and insolence men will reach a point that the Lord will not permit them to pass. And they will learn that there is a limit to the forbearance of Jehovah. When we go to the Bible we find such language. Chapter 2 of the book of Isaiah projects us from the microcosm of his day to the macrocosm of the end of the world in which we are living. In verses 12 to 17 we read, The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and they will be humbled. For all the tower in mountains and all the high hills, for, for every lofty tower, and every fortified wall. The arrogance of man will be brought low and human pride humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Prophet Zephaniah employed a similar language to project the end of the world. We can read it in Zephaniah 1 verses 14 to 17. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the high corner towers. When men forget God and build themselves up for their own vain glory, they unknowingly open the doors for the introduction of the devil who begins his work of destruction. The spirit of prophecy portrays the state of the world before the coming of the Lord. Look at this statement. Those who hold the reins of government are not able to solve the problem of moral corruption, poverty, pauperism, and increasing crime. They are struggling in vain to place business operations on a more secure basis. If men would give more heed to the teaching 
of God's word, they would find a solution of the problems that perplex them. Isn't that happening in the modern globalization we are living in, in the economic competition between emerging and developed countries and among the same economic superpowers? The problem lies in human selfishness, which prevents the establishment of a stable economic system. The Book of Revelation warned that, in the end, a mark would be imposed on the right hand and on the forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, the name of the beast or the number of his name. In another message, I explain this prophecy in detail. But here we want to highlight the principle involved that seems to fit into the modern democratic system because it uses more benign methods of pressure instead of killing the other one with a gun. And he is one to starve to death if he does not do as he is commanded. And because Europe and the United States together economically dominate the world, they try to subdue everyone else by imposing a commercial boycott on them. Boycott has been effectively used by the United States government for years. It brought down Nicaragua and Haiti some years ago. Cuba and now Venezuela have become a hard bone to know for Western powers because they developed a political method in which the last ones to fall will be the rulers regardless of whether the settlers die sooner or not. They also used boycott to bring down the Soviet Union. They then used that method with Iran and North Korea. And that is the method that, according to the Apocalypse, is to be used in the end to subject everyone to the will of the rebel prince. On 24 November 2011, the Vatican proposed the establishment of a political, spiritual and moral global public authority to control the market. No wonder this was always the strategy of the Catholic Church by which it ruled the world for more than a millennium. It even seemed that the Pope wanted to suggest being the emperor himself. But when considering history, it can be seen that the papacy has always handled emperors through whom it enforced its designs. On March 24, 2010, the need to impose a religious day for all began to be debated in the European Parliament. That day is, of course, Sunday. This continued on June 20, 2011. It is a political, social, economic and religious struggle involving churches, civil societies and girls. And later, as seen in the encyclical Laudato Si, Pope Francis began to use the threat of global warning in our common house, the planet, to impose Sunday as a green day, as an ecological day, where no polluting gases would be emitted. It is admirable again to see how Ellen G. White anticipated all this. She said in 1899, when Protestant churches shall unite with the secular power to sustain a false religion for opposing which their ancestors endure the first persecution, then will the papal Sabbath be enforced by the combined authority of church and state. There will be a national apostasy which will land only in national rule. It is at the time of the national apostasy when acting on the policy of Satan, the rulers of the land will rank themselves on the side of the man of sin. It is then the measure of guilt is full. The national apostasy is the signal for national rule. We see in today's globalized world a picture similar to that of dominoes. One token falls and that domino effect causes the others to begin to fall as well, especially in relation to the great powers. The Apostle James warned of this that would come upon the whole world. Now, listen, you rich people, weep and well because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted 
and moths have eaten your clothes, bubbles in our economic modern language. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. This mammoth accumulation of wealth began to appear more definitely about 30 years ago with the commercial globalization. Look, the ways you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. This is the reason why a final economic collapse will fall upon the world, preceded by warnings and anticipatory judgments. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. What to do in such a circumstance? Did the apostles advise the brothers who would live in the very end of time go to the street to protest and require the defense of their rights? No, this doesn't fall within the religious perspective. And though as citizens everyone can protest by requiring their rights to be respected when they see that it is feasible, but the Apostle avoided entering a political framework and sought to strengthen the faith and spiritual power of his readers. He wrote, be patient, then brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rain. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. James 5 verses 1 to 6. When we arrived in the United States, our children were young and I was having some trouble at first as we tried to move the wheel of our family economy. An old friend who had arrived here earlier asked me, how much are you worth? What? I asked him. He insisted. Don't you know that in this country one asks the other how much you're worth? That is, how much do you have in money and properties? Me, I replied. How much am I worth? Nothing. I got nothing. Then he said, if you have $100,000, people look at you and don't pay attention at who you are. If you have $500,000 or a million dollars, they might say, interesting. But to respect you, you have to have more money. And I thought, then you mean that I'm nobody here, that I'm not worth anything to the people of this country. After a while, I changed my mind. I thought, yes. I'm worth a lot, and more than all the worldly wealth that can be ever gathered by human mortals. The highest price that any person or earthly institution or country can ever pay was paid for me. And I tell you, my dear friend, that if you want to receive the offer, the same price was also paid for your ransom. The investment God made in you and me is priceless and will keep its infinite value for all eternity. That price paid for us is the blood of the Son of God, of the Creator of the universe. And that's what gives value to my life and to all life. Let us insist on this point. The price God paid to adopt us as his children will never lose its worth. It will never be devalued. If here on earth you do not have a rich father who can leave you a valuable inheritance, you must know that in heaven you have the wealthiest father in the universe who will share with you his inheritance if you just want to accept his redemption. So no one should feel that it's worthless. Let's leave that materialistic concern to others. 
God sets his eyes on you to tell you that he paid the price for his son's blood so that you can dream of the golden mansions and every precious stone he has prepared in his holy city. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, is the advice of the Apostle James, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Yes, we have the right to protest, but let us not soil our hearts in such a way as to be deprived of that future inheritance. Justice and vengeance is God's. Let us know, however, that what David said about the righteous here on earth is true. I have not seen the just helpless, nor his seed begging for bread. The same God who cares for orphans and widows and who does not ignore when a bird falls is the one who will take care of you too. The book of Revelation says that the great earthly city would be ultimately broken into three parts. This is a reference to the great Babylon that represents Rome, but which encompasses the whole world in the final globalization in which we live today. It is then that the largest earthquake in history occurs. The fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. We are reaching that final moment in wavering. The apostle wrote, The cities of the nation fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Revelation 16, verses 19 and 20. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. The merchants were the great ones of the earth. Revelation 18, verses 1 to 23. What a contrast was seen when the Son of the God of the universe came. No place was found for that son in a palace or in any house or inn. That majestic prince of heaven came as a little boy to, raise, to rest in a stable, in a manger, in a place that served for animal feed. The first sounds that baby could hear were the moans of cows and the bleatings of the sheep. The air he began breathing was not scented with precious ointments. But he had to become accustomed to the nauseating smell of a stable. That is why the apostle said of him, emphasizing the contrast. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. And Mary, his mother, could see that through his son, God, has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Luke 1, verses 52 and 53. What's our problem today? That we live in a materialized world which only wants bread and circles, that spends all our lives looking for pleasures and comfort. And we are given the warning in the revelation, you say, I am rich, I am acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. Revelation 3.17 Several years ago, I heard a preacher who went to China when the bamboo curtain had not been fully opened yet. And he was surprised to hear the prayers of those who met in secret. They thanked God for the many things God gave them. And he could not understand. He said, they don't have a washing machine. They don't have refrigerators, they don't have a TV, they don't have computers, they don't have the many material things that we have at that time. But then that preacher caught the message. God fills these people with spiritual blessings 
while we have enriched ourselves with material things, and we lack the spiritual power they have. I counsel you to buy from me, said Jesus in Revelation 13, 18, addressing his message directly to us who live in the last generation, to buy gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. The final crisis will burn the skull that covers the gold which God wants to bring out in us. That you buy white clothes to wear, Jesus continues saying, that is, his justice, so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. So our eyes may be illuminated to have true spiritual discernment to grasp what is our real condition. Revelation 3 verse 18. To the second church of the Revelation, Jesus says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich, Revelation 2.9. Do we want to be rich in the spiritual sense? Then let's not lean on material things. Let's not run excessively behind temporary incentives as all of these will eventually be lost. It is legitimate to strive for economic well-being and wealth. But let us never stop putting God first, nor neglect ever you to secure the purpose of our lives, which is to secure our souls to be saved and to have eternal life. Well done, good and faithful servant, the Lord will finally tell us. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things, Matthew 25, 23. Yes, we have a rich Father in heaven who will share with us his heritage as creator of the universe. How great it will be to hear the Lord's invitation, come and share your master's happiness. It doesn't matter to him how much you have or how much you're worth materially. For him what counts is your spiritual nature, your conversion of heart to become a subject of his celestial kingdom. Dear friend who are listening to me, the Lord calls you to open your heart to Him, and He wants to fill you today with spiritual riches. It can also give you material wealth. But don't put all your hope in there, because a war, a bubble, a catastrophe, a disease can throw you on the ground and make you lose all those earthly dreams. I invite you today to place your faith and hope in the heavenly treasures. Those treasures never lost their value. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings you give us, not only materially, but also and especially spiritually. We want to receive more blessings as we prepare ourselves for the second coming of our Lord. We dream with the moment when you will give us all what you promised, that tremendous and wonderful heritage that are waiting for us in your kingdom. Give us your spirit to do your will and to be faithful till your, the coming of your Son. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.